Incoming transmission. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to True Spies. Week by week, mission by mission, you'll hear the true stories behind the world's greatest espionage operations. You'll meet the people who navigate this secret world. What do they know? What are their skills? And what would you do in their position? This is True Spies. You know, over the course of almost 30 years, I've arrested something like 600 people. And I've met a lot of people that have done evil things. But I've only met maybe a dozen people that I viewed as eat your soul kind of evil people. And Farron Loveless was one of those people. This is True Spies. Episode 101, The Man on the Mountain. The panhandle of Idaho is is mostly forested. It's rolling hills, it's blue lakes, and it's absolutely a gorgeous part of the United States. Clean air, blue skies, big country. The mountains of northern Idaho conjure up a vision of a lost America, a vast and mighty land of fur trappers, log cabins, and intrepid frontiersmen. Close your eyes. Smell the wet pine hanging in the air. And do your best to ignore that tickling sensation on the back of your neck. You know the one. So the forest can be, you know, like a canopy jungle sometimes with the huge ponderosa pines and larch and lodgepole and spruce. Very thick cover, easy for someone to hide in these rural areas and and just sort of wait and watch. In the forest, you're never truly alone. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing depends entirely on who is watching whom. We didn't want to get so close that we we alerted him. We we had word that he had placed booby traps around the entry points to the mountain, so we were very careful. But we wanted to get a, a lay of the land, so to speak, and see if any of the people up there were ever in you know imminent danger. In this case, you can breathe easy. We're on the side of the watchers. Well, one watcher in particular. He's on the trail of a fugitive from justice a murderous white supremacist with a criminal record as long as his mean streak. In order to effect this arrest without getting anyone hurt, we came up with half a dozen different plans. This week's true spy is many things. A spy technically isn't one of them. But the unique tradecraft of his profession, the fine art of manhunting, would serve you well in most any branch of the intelligence community. My name is Mark Cameron. I was the Deputy United States Marshal from 1991 to 2012. Since my retirement, I transitioned into uh, writing novels full-time. At present, I write the Jack Ryan novels for the Tom Clancy Estate and Penguin Random House Publishers, as well as my own series. Well, inspiration has to come from somewhere. And in Mark's long career, he's built up a bit of a surplus. The United States Marshal Service is the oldest federal law enforcement agency in the USA. It was uh, started by George Washington in 1789. We started off basically just enforcing federal law because they didn't want the army military to be law enforcement officers in the United States. Today, the Marshal Service's duties include the protection of federal judges, Supreme Court justices, and foreign dignitaries. And that's the tame stuff. We spend a lot of time hunting fugitives. That's probably the sexiest part of our job. We focus on it, we spend a lot of time on it. And so we're very good at uh, manhunting, if you will. We also handle all the the federal prisoners, making sure they get back and forth to court and then eventually turn them over to the Bureau of Prisons. Uh, We also run the witness security program and um, have a special operations group, which is like a SWAT team, but on a federal level. If you're looking for a role that's light on paperwork and heavy on action, the marshals might just be for you. 
not to mention the other perks. When I was in high school, I lived in a, a small town in Texas, and I was standing around with some friends on the courthouse square one day, and I saw this tall guy with a hat, and he had a gun and a badge on his belt, and he got out of his truck, and he put a little bag over the top of a parking meter that said, Official Business, United States Marshal. And I, I was about 15, and I remember thinking, I want a job where I can have one of those bags someday. I got a job, went to college, uh, got a job with the Weatherford Police Department in Texas, a small department, worked there for about not quite seven years, applied with the marshals. It took me about two and a half years to get on. Once Mark was through the door, the real challenge began. We were the very first class in 1991, in January of 91. They send us to the Federal Law Enforcement Training Academy at Glencoe, Georgia, and you go through 10, 11 weeks of uh, training to be a criminal investigator for the government. And virtually all criminal investigators for the government, special agents, if you will, with the exception of the FBI and DEA who go to Quantico. All the rest of us go to FLETC, as it's affectionately known, or a Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. After FLETC, rookie marshals undergo a particularly hands-on training program unique to the service. Post our FLETC training, then the United States Marshal Service has its own training right there on the same grounds, but we're trained by different cadre of instructors who are all marshal service. So we stay there for six weeks. That training involves surveillance. We have a lot of fleet vehicles that we check out and surveil role players around Brunswick and North Georgia and, and all that area. That's all fairly involved work, true. But when we say hands-on, we do mean hands-on. Marshal Service is kind of known for having a big fight at the end among ourselves where we're paired off with someone in a fight called a kumite. And uh, many people out on the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center come and watch our final kumite. And they always make sure they do it after we've done the final firearms qualification and our final fitness test because a lot of people get hurt. But they they want us to know what, what it's really like to fight because the Marshal Service is a boots-on-the-ground agency and service. So once we go out, we're immediately tasked with uh, going out and doing the job. So they really want us to show us the reality of it. Believe it or not, some criminals really don't want to be caught. And when push comes to shove, a deputy marshal needs to be able to handle themselves. We talk about the stories of when we got into a fight, but 90% of those fights are people trying to get away and maybe even a higher percentage of that. And that's not really a fight. That's, you know, you can get hurt, they can get hurt, you know, fall down, whatever, and they might throw a punch or something. But the ones that we really trained for were the true fights where someone turned and came back at you and said, I'm going to kill you to get away. And that's what we really trained for that moment. The story you're about to hear details a joint operation between the marshals, local law enforcement, and the FBI. When you're out in a smaller area away from everything, you have to rely on one another. We used to joke when I first started back in the day when Hertz and I think Alamo rental cars, one of them had a commercial that said, we're number two, so we try harder. And that's the way the Marshal Service has always sort of been with the Bureau. We're number two, so we're going to try harder. That can be a very healthy competition as long as you also coordinate This story takes place in the northern part of Idaho in the Idaho Panhandle, from Coeur d'Alene all the way up to the Canadian border. The scenic town of Coeur d'Alene is nestled between wooded mountains, winding rivers, and sparkling lakes. So I transferred to the Coeur d'Alene office of the United States Marshal Service District of Idaho in summer of, of 1994. A dream posting for a nature lover like Mark Cameron. I've been an avid outdoorsman my whole life, out, you know, fishing and hunting and camping and hiking. And, and so I already had some basics in tracking just without any actual training. Unfortunately, when Mark arrived in Coeur d'Alene, U.S. Marshals were persona non grata. Two years previously, 
federal officers had attempted to serve an arrest warrant to Randy Weaver, a Christian fundamentalist and self-described white separatist. You might have heard the story. Weaver and his family, who embraced a survivalist lifestyle, had opted to remove themselves from society. They lived an isolated existence on Ruby Ridge, around two hours' drive from Coeur d'Alene. The attempt to arrest Weaver escalated into an armed siege of the family's remote farm. FBI was present, ATF was present, the United States Marshal Service was present. During the 11-day standoff, Weaver's wife Vicky and 14-year-old son Sammy were killed by law enforcement. The event sent shockwaves through the rural communities in the region. It was very rural up in the mountains of North Idaho and There was a lot of mistrust sown against the federal government because of perceptions of what happened. And that's the situation that my partner and I went into a couple of years later when we were transferred. A deputy marshal was also fatally shot by an associate of the Weavers. The incident at Ruby Ridge raised questions about the use of deadly force by the US government. And for some, stained the reputation of the Marshal Service in Northern Idaho. And so the powers that be in the federal government, the Department of Justice and the U.S. Marshal Service decided that they should staff the Coeur d'Alene office, which was 400 miles away from the main office down in Boise. The higher-ups in the Marshal Service decided that a friendly presence in Coeur d'Alene would be a good first step towards building bridges in the region. Mark was encouraged to enroll his children in a local school, become part of the community. So myself and my partner were transferred to North Idaho in the midst of quite a bit of uh, extremism and white supremacy and that sort of thing. Two years into this sensitive posting, Mark and his partner received an assignment which echoed with the memory of Ruby Ridge. So sometime in early 1996, I... uh, received an assignment to work a warrant on a fugitive, a parole violator by the name of Farron Lovelace. Farron Lovelace, confessed racist and white separatist, a member of the Aryan People's Republic, a white supremacist organization whose members have been responsible for a spate of robberies and murders in the mid-90s, escaped federal custody during a prisoner transport. His original crime was uh, armed robbery, and he had fled parole and was on the run. Now it was up to the marshals to track the fugitive down, serve him with an arrest warrant, and put him back behind bars. We had some information that he might be hiding out in a trailer in North Idaho. Lovelace was holed up somewhere in the mountains. And so my partner and I, along with some agents from the Coeur d'Alene office of the FBI began to work the case. Where Randy Weaver had, his supporters argued, simply wanted to live apart from mainstream society, Farron Lovelace was an active menace to it. What we did know about Farron Lovelace, and we knew very little in the beginning, but what we did know is that he had a a record for armed robbery. We believed that he had kidnapped a couple over in Spokane because of their, they had a Jewish name and he had basically dressed up in camouflage and befriended their dogs and spent a lot of time surveilling them and then snuck into their house and and kidnapped them and held them for a number of hours overnight. After speaking to Lovelace's victims in Spokane, Mark and his team began to learn more about the fugitive. He thought of himself as a uh, an assassin, or he was training to be an assassin, and so he had this hit list and wanted to, by his own words, lay down his life for the white race. And so we we were sort of ramping up our search for him as we found out a little more about that. And after knocking on doors across northern Idaho, the marshals made a breakthrough. Our informant on Farron Loveless actually came to us. You know, we had, whenever you look for someone, you obviously turn over a lot of stones and, and open a lot of doors and talk to a lot of people. And so it was, it was well known in North Idaho that the marshals were out looking for Farron Loveless. 
the informant had credible information about the whereabouts of Farron Lovelace. Suffice it to say, getting there would be no easy feat. He told us that Farron was holed up on a mountain in this Pack River area, very remote, logging roads and trails going up, places where you couldn't even get a vehicle, you had to walk. But what motivated this informant to give Lovelace up to the feds? It's hard to tell what somebody's motivation is as an informant, but this particular informant cared about the people that were up on the mountain and he wanted to take care of them. And so his goal, if you will, is to, he he didn't seem to have any particularly great love for, for us, but he did want to take care of the other people that were on the mountain. No, Lovelace wasn't alone. During his time on the run, a period of more than a year in total. He'd fallen in love with a woman who lived on the mountain. She shared his hyper-conservative views on race and religion and had become his common-law wife. She was some 20 years older than Lovelace, around 60 to his 39, and shared her cabin with a teenage grandson. Like the weavers on Ruby Ridge, the couple chose to live as far away from other people as possible. Their cabin received no mail, had no electricity or running water, and was rustically adorned with Harley Davidson posters and religious iconography. They lived on preserved food and had little contact with their distant neighbors except to replenish their supplies. They spent an entire winter up there hiding in this little, is a part of a national forest, and they just squatted on it, if you will, and built their little cabin and tarp lean-tos and that sort of thing. So obviously with the issues of Ruby Ridge, there was no way that we were going to be able to go up and attempt to make an arrest on a rural mountain like that with civilians involved. A guns blazing approach was off the table. Remember, part of Mark's mission in Coeur d'Alene is to restore trust between the federal government and the locals. But the informant was wary of the effect Farron Lovelace's presence might have on the woman and boy who shared the cabin. He knew that Lovelace was a dangerous man who associated with dangerous people. This was a powerful motivation to assist the marshals, despite his personal distaste for the service. Able to travel freely between the trailer and the town below, the informant became a vital source of information on the fugitive's movements. There was no doubt in my mind that he risked his life going back and forth and and, um, helping out. But second-hand intelligence is never as reliable as the information you collect yourself. And Mark had a variety of means by which to gather first-hand intel on Farron Lovelace. So during our investigation and and the fugitive hunt for Farron, we we used everything in our power. We had aerial surveillance. We went up the mountain on foot several times as far as we dared. We didn't want to get so close that we, we alerted him. The mountain was Lovelace's home turf. The marshals had to be extremely careful to avoid discovery. But that wasn't the only risk. We had word that he had placed booby traps around the the entry points to the mountain, so we were very careful. But we wanted to get a a lay of the land, so to speak, and see if any of the people up there were ever in, you know, imminent danger that we at least knew our routes to get up there. So think about it. The man you're hunting is hiding in dense forest. You can't track his movements from the air can't get closer to his encampment on foot without risking life or limb in one of his jerry-rigged booby traps. Heavy vehicles are out of the question too. A show of force like that, so soon after Ruby Ridge, is unthinkable. Firearms? Likewise, too much risk. So what can you do? Well, you could fight booby traps with booby traps. Farron, we knew that he came on and off the mountain because a lot of places you just couldn't get a vehicle. He would sometimes come down for supplies or whatnot, whatever reason to come off the mountain. He had a 10-speed mountain bike, and he kept that hidden about halfway down the mountain, kind of cached under some logs. And so we thought we could maybe, one of the plans we came up with was booby-trapping the mountain bike and getting him there. 
You might be wondering, how do you booby trap a mountain bike? Cut the brake line, let down a tire or two. We were going to put like a flashbang, like a concussion grenade on the bike so that when he moved it, it would stun him. And we would be able to effect the arrest at that time. We sent that up the chain to Marshal Service Headquarters and Department of Justice, and they ixnayed that because they were afraid that the grandson might be coming down with them sometime and we, we might put them in danger. Again, the marshals can't risk any collateral casualties. So think outside the box. If you can't get to the man on the mountain, you need to bring the man on the mountain to you. But how do you bait a person like Farron Lovelace? He lives in a cabin and survives on tinned food. Clearly, fine living doesn't motivate him. Nor can you appeal to his better nature. He'd need to actually have one. I can't speak to his mental state, you know, how sane he was or whatnot, but he certainly did some horrible, horrible things and seemed to do them without compunction. In fact, he looked for and sought out people to harm. Lovelace's hatred was specific, and a negative motivation is still a motivation. And that can be exploited. We knew that that Farron was extremely racist. He had very strict, very strong views about the white race and, and anybody that wasn't white. Mark and his colleagues got to thinking of how they could exploit Lovelace's bigotry to their advantage. And so we came up with a ruse to get him off the mountain by getting him information that there was a Hispanic arms dealer slash drug dealer in Priest River, Idaho, a little probably the nearest town to where he was hiding out, that had some girls with him, some white women that he was basically recruiting into prostitution. The story, to be delivered to Lovelace by Mark's informant, was scientifically calculated to push as many of Lovelace's buttons as possible. Our ruse was to play on Farron's hatred to get him off the mountain to come down and stop this drug and arms dealer. The person did not exist. In fact, we kind of as a little Easter egg between ourselves, we named the person after the director of the Marshal Service, whose last name was Gonzalez at the time. So we had this drug arms dealer It was all in our operations plan. The plan was sent up the flagpole to the Department of Justice. This time, it was approved. Before long, Mark's informant had fed Farron Lovelace the fake intel on Gonzalez, a fictional arms and narcotics dealer sowing discord in Bonner County, Idaho. Never one to turn down the chance to act out a racist revenge fantasy, the fugitive took the bait hook, line and sinker. The information was relayed to Farron. He was incensed, of course. Which meant that it was the time to begin preparing for the final phase of the operation, arresting Lovelace. A team moved into position on the mountain highway. And we had a a person watching as he hit Highway 2 coming into Priest River. Once the lookout had eyes on Lovelace, the net began to close in. From the west, an FBI agent drove his jeep at a safe distance behind Lovelace's pushbike. And I would travel eastbound, and we would trap Farron on his bicycle. The arrest team comprising several members of the FBI, local law enforcement, and one cool-headed U.S. Marshal, planned to close in on Lovelace at a strategic point in his journey. There's a bridge that crosses the actual river, the Priest River, before he gets into town. And it's it's quite a long bridge. And um, a place where we could get him away from other traffic and with no people, because we knew he was going to be armed. Well, no self-respecting assassin in training goes peddling around without some firepower. He was always armed, and our informant said that we could count on him being armed. So he did come off the mountain. He's tooling along on his bicycle. 
By radio, we were informed. All right, he's got a backpack. The FBI agent that was following him right behind him in the Jeep saw that he had a revolver in his back pocket and it looked like the butt of a a rifle sticking out the top of his um, backpack. Wouldn't necessarily notice it if you didn't know what you were looking for, but it was a small folding stock, I think Mini 14. A Ruger Mini 14 is a tactical semi-automatic rifle and you can be sure that Lovelace knew his way around it. So far, everything seemed to be going as planned. What happened next, Mark doesn't quite remember, but something went badly wrong. I think Farron noticed the FBI agent, and so the FBI agent went ahead and forced him off the road as I was approaching right before he got to the bridge. And so there was a Bonner County deputy right behind me, me, Farron on the bicycle, the FBI agent facing me and the Bonner County deputy with with Farron kind of squoze in the middle. So Farron fell off the bicycle, tumbled into the ditch. It looked like a very violent fall. There's only so much you can plan for. A good manhunter needs to be able to adapt to the situation at hand. There's no time to reflect on what could have gone differently. If Lovelace manages to draw his weapon, he won't hesitate to fire. The priority now is containment. When we bailed out of our car, the FBI agent was supposed to be contact, and he had enough experience that he didn't do the the magnet and run right towards. So he jumped out with his firearm, the Bonner County, and uh, Deputy and I were the, the contact officers. So the FBI agent was cover, we were contact. As the FBI agent drew a bead on Lovelace, Mark and the local policeman raced towards the fugitive's prone body. It soon became apparent that he wouldn't be going down without a fight. We ran up to Farron, got control of him. He wrestled with us quite a bit. I had a hold of him, but the Bonner County deputy was a big, huge dude, quite muscular, and he, he just yanked him away from me and flipped him over. So we were able to get him handcuffed. Lovelace was secure. But I will never forget when I stood fairing up, he's handcuffed, he's got grass stains on his shirt, and you know, there's still guns being secured on the ground. It happened very quickly. And he looked up at me with his eyes kind of blinking, surprised, and he said, it is obvious to me that you are more racially pure than I am, or you never would have won that fight. Those words, spoken with quiet but total assurance, remain with Mark to this day. I had been in law enforcement for well over 10 years and met murderers and rapists and child abusers and whatnot, and I would get sad or despondent or whatever, but rarely was I actually chilled. Farron Loveless had the effect of chilling me when I spoke with him. With the operation at an end, Mark and his fellow officers could take a breath. Lovelace had been captured without any collateral casualties. This would not be a repeat of Ruby Ridge. You know, it's hard to say what Farron Lovelace wanted as far as a standoff or an arrest. Uh, it, It seemed to me when we arrested him that he was armed to the teeth, ready to take down this fictitious arms slash drug dealer that we had made up. But there's there's little doubt in my mind from talking to him that he would have had no problem at all shooting it out with the police. And, And early on, he wanted, he said that he wanted to die. You know, he ticked all the boxes for somebody that wanted to to go out in a blaze of glory. And we have to keep that in mind when we do plan operational plans for arrest because we contrary to, you know, books that I write or movies or whatever, we really want to get out of this with the least amount of violence as possible. Uh, We want to be prepared for violence, but certainly want to get out of it with the least amount. Driving away from the scene of the arrest, Lovelace revealed the true depths of his maladjustment. So once I had Farron in the car, he 
started talking immediately. He, he, he really dovetailed on to the initial statement he made about me being more uh, racially pure. He talked about his own quest. He talked about a hit list he had that incidentally had uh, the sitting sheriff of Bonner County at the time on the list and some judges and, and just anybody that he deemed as a threat to the white race, in, in his words, were on this hit list. But the fugitive wasn't entirely without compassion. He did seem to care for the common law wife he'd left up on the mountain that day. Lovelace wanted to make a deal to protect her from the attention of the federal government. His bargaining chip? A disturbing confession. He would confess to a murder that he committed the year before of a, another white supremacist in the area named Jeremy Scott. We had no idea that Scott had been killed, but he confessed to me in the backseat of that car that he had killed, that he had kidnapped him, held him at gunpoint, knocked his tooth out with a pistol, that they spent all night in this cabin praying and reading the Bible and fair and quizzing Scott about things. And from what, and, and Farron has changed his story several times, but when he first told me, he said he was afraid that Scott was going to basically rat out the rest of the, the white supremacist group that he was a part of. So he ended up uh, shooting him in the back of the head and taking his body up to a very remote area up in the Pack River country and uh, burying him up there. We had no idea about it. In fact, Farron, as part of his uh, confession, agreed to take us out to the, the place where the body was. A year later, Farron Lovelace would be sentenced to death for the murder of Jeremy Scott. And I should say that he has, by his own words, he said, I'm an evil man and I deserve to be destroyed. But at the time, there was only one thing left to do. Go back up the mountain. Unsurprisingly, the caution they had exercised earlier in the operation turned out to be well-founded. At this point, with Farron not there... We um, felt comfortable in calling out the elderly woman and the grandson. We had our informant with us that knew them. Uh, he was able to help us call them out. And um, it, it went relatively smoothly. There was a lot of cursing going on and, and uh, you know, hatred against the federal government. But they gave up peacefully. What we did find was quite a few booby traps, uh, fishing line with hooks hung from trees. We found some um, small, for lack of a better term, homemade landmines that are basically a shotgun shell stuck between a split piece of wood with a nail at the bottom, and then they're buried. So if you step on them, then they detonate and, and blow off your foot. So we found several of those. Um, and then some other little uh, items, quite a bit of, of quote-unquote, survival list kind of things. One of the Bonner County Sheriff's men was alarmed to discover what he believed to be a bouncing Betty landmine. I called the FBI agent friend of mine that was a former Navy SEAL and described it to him, and he said, no, that's a filter for a, a gas mask. And somebody up there, I'm not sure who, ended up shooting it, and it certainly was a... <laughs> nothing more than a filter, but we had it cordoned off like an explosive for a while. In fact, I still have that uh, on my writing desk. I was able to to get that released by the attorneys, and I have that uh, filter with a bullet hole in it from my inspiration on my desk. But we were able to clear it off and come back down the mountain and, and uh, have some more very interesting talks with uh, Farron. Later in his career, Mark transferred to Alaska, as if northern Idaho hadn't been wild enough. He still lives there today, writing novels and taking in the great outdoors. And so my writing, I, I loved the marshal service. I was the chief deputy at the time. I just loved the folks I was working with. I loved the mission of the marshal service. But uh, I'd also always wanted to be a writer. And so when I turned 50, I contacted my publisher in New York and said, uh, you think we can ramp this up and I can do one book a year? And they said, you bet. And so I retired and wrote several more Jericho Quinn novels, was eventually approached by the publishing company that 
Penguin Random House, which uh, works with the Tom Clancy estate to write the Jack Ryan novels and then my own series, the Arliss Cutter series as well. So I basically was able to retire at age 50 and fortunately was able to seamlessly move over into being a a full-time novelist and with still many contacts in law enforcement and friends in law enforcement. My own son is still in law enforcement, so I'm able to have lots of uh, inspiration for the books. But I, I have to say that I miss it every day. The latest installment in Mark's Arliss Cutter series, Cold Snap, is available from April the 26th, 2022. I'm Vanessa Kirby. Here's a taste of next week's declassified outing with True Spies.